he had indeed wrecked the Scotch Express. It wasn't entirely his fault. The engine drivers hadn't obeyed the new Rule 55, and the company didn't believe in signal collars. It encouraged carelessness in the signalman, they said. As was to happen five years later at Quintins Hill, gas cylinders had exploded, and in moments the whole wreck had caught fire, and 12 people had died. Apart from underlining the idiocy of the company towards collars, the main thing that came from this accident was a push forward for a new device. The inspecting officer felt that because of the complex engine movements here, the stretch should be track-circuited. This was an American device used in the States since the 1880s, but it was only just coming into this country. Each section or block of track was electrically insulated from its neighbour. From a battery, an electric current ran along one rail, through an instrument, and back down the other rail. When a train came into the section, the current short-circuited through its metal wheels and axles, and so never reached the instrument. Without the current, the instrument moved over to a new reading. Now, by looking at your instruments, you could see if there was something on your section. It was a big step towards making it very difficult for a signalman to forget. While these advances were making double track working safer, even more rigorous systems had been worked out for single lines. It was often said that single line working was safer once you'd avoided the risk of two trains running into the same stretch of line from opposite directions. It all had to be carefully planned so that trains passed at stations where there were double lines. To avoid trains being sent to meet each other between the stations, Edward Tyre, a great signal engineer, had invented his tablet system. On his system, an engine driver could only enter a single line section if he had a token, the tablet, that gave him the right to enter that particular stretch of track. At each end of a section, there was an instrument into which the tablets fitted. The two instruments were electrically interlocked, so that a tablet could only be taken out by the simultaneous cooperation of operators at both ends of the section. In this way, each end could hardly avoid knowing what the other was doing. Like collars, this system was only a formalized memory jogger. It took no responsibility, but simply helped the human actors to play their parts more accurately. It had worked well for something like 40 years until January 1921, nine years after Tyre's death. Two trains were approaching Abermule Station on the borders of Wales, an express and a stopping train. If one or other had been late, then they'd have passed at the next station along. The tablet instruments were in the station buildings, and although only the signalman and station master were by the rules allowed to operate them, in practice they were worked by any of the station staff. On this particular day, it was the signalman who quite legally went down to the apparatus to allow the signalman at Montgomery, the station to the north of Abermule, to take a tablet from his instrument and so let the slow train come on towards Abermule. He then went off to set the points for this first train. While he was doing this, the only people in the station buildings within earshot of the Abermule tablet instruments were a young porter and a boy. Neither of them had permission to work the instruments. Nevertheless, when Newtown, the next station to the south, sent the signal to ask permission to send up the other train, the express from the opposite direction, the young porter broke the rules and went off to operate the instrument that let the Newtown signalman take out a tablet at the other end. Now the instruments show trains approaching Abermule from both directions, but so far so good, for the track divides here to let them pass. The porter went off to set his points. Nobody told anybody anything, but the instruments showed what was happening, and because they were electrically interlocked, nobody could get another tablet out before a tablet from one of the two trains was returned.
The first train to arrive was the stopping train, and out came the boy, breaking the rules again, to take the tablet from the driver. He intended to change it for the one for the next section, which, of course, he could not have done until the instrument was unlocked with the tablet from the express at present occupying that line. At this point, the story becomes confused. The boy, it seems, met the station master, who'd been busy in the goods yard, and said something like, you take this, and I'll collect the tickets, whereupon he passed the tablet over. Railwaymen are always impatient to get trains on their way, and so, assuming that today the trains were to pass at the next station, the station master made the crucial mistake. Not realizing which tablet he'd got, and without checking what was written on it, he just accepted that it was for the next section and simply passed it back to the driver who had brought it. All right. yes, sir. Even now, the system should have failed safe. By the rules, the driver should have checked that the tablet was the right one for this section, but he didn't, and he set off from Abermule for Newtown with, as his authority, the tablet for the previous section. Only when the boy went to the tablet room to give the train entering section signal did anyone realize, too late, the terrible mistake they'd made. The local train went through the points and onto the same track as the approaching express. Pictures taken 50 years ago show that a series of trivial human errors were able to defeat a most ingenious mechanical device. The engine men of the stopping train were instantly crushed by the heavier locomotive of the express. The boiler of the express was torn clean from its frame, but its crew survived. 15 passengers were killed and 26 more were injured. The inspector suggested that the tablet instruments should be interlocked with the signals, so that unless the correct tablet was out, it would be impossible to give the signal to start. This interlocking of apparatus, so that things can only be done in the correct order and in the correct way, was not only vital for single line working, it became the cornerstone of the system of control of all rail movements. By this stage of the story, the machinery is beginning to look fairly foolproof. What with the signals and points locked automatically against the moves of a mistaken signalman, it begins to look as though the chances of an accident happening are very slim. But then came one accident which showed how, if there was the slightest possibility of an accident happening, then happen it eventually will. There are just so many signals, so many trains, so many possibilities, that sooner or later the million to one chance comes up. Outside this station, the million to one chance came up. It's Hull Paragon Station, as it is now. But early on the morning of St. Valentine's Day, 1927, the situation was just the same. A train was leaving the station at almost the precise moment that another was due to arrive from the opposite direction. The signalmen in the box were hurrying. One was looking after the signals for the departing train, while another was ready to set the points for the arrival as soon as he could. The actual setting for the accident involved a signal on this massive gantry and a set of points in the midst of this complicated mesh of tracks.